I think it's time to go ahead and get started. It's 1210. So uh, welcome to NVZ lunch. Um, does anybody have any announcements before I get started with the list of uh, other talks that are happening around campus in the next week? No announcements? All right, so I'll just jump right into this then. Uh, so the ESPM seminar, uh, which is scheduled for Thursday from 3.30 to 4.30 in 132 Mulford Hall is being presented by Karen Joyce from James Cook University, but we don't have a title, it's a title to be announced. I don't know if anybody in the room might know what the actual title is, probably not. Um, the uh, IB lunch seminar on Thursday, or sorry, the IB seminar on, on Thursday is, uh, is Hannah Carey from the University of Wisconsin-Madison who will be uh, presenting a talk titled Sharing Resources in Lean Times, a Functional Role for the Gut Microbiome During Hibernation. Uh, ESSIG Branch this week on Friday from 10 to 11 is the Entomology Social Hour. Botany Lunch, which is in VLSB 1002, uh, also on Friday uh, from 12 to 1. It will be uh, presented by June Bando, Executive Director of the California Native Plant Society. Uh, and June Bondo's title is Evidence Informed Advocacy, a Nonprofit Perspective. And then Fossil Coffee, which is on Tuesday of next week uh, at 11, downstairs in the Fish Bowl, I believe, uh, is actually a split presentation, two presenters. So one presenter is Jacqueline Silveria, uh, and the second presenter is Isaiah Newbins. I think they're, they must both be of University of Washington. Uh, the title of the Talk being presented by Jacqueline Silveria is The Rise of Ungulate Mammals After the Extinction of Non-Avian Dinosaurs, The Perspective from Northeastern Montana. And the presentation by, by Isaiah Newbins is titled Plans to Examine the Judith River Formation Mammalian Fauna in Fine Scale, Part 1, Multituberculous. <laughs> Uh, and then next week's NBC Lunch Seminar is a, a finishing talk, I believe, it must be, uh, by Kwasi, Kwasi Rensford, uh, and his title is Behavioral Responses to Climate Change in Chipmunks of the Sierra Nevada. So if anybody else has any other talk announcements, now will be the time to mention them. No? Okay, so great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Sean Harrington. Uh, Sean, uh, just to run through his record. He did his, his undergraduate degree at North Central College. Make sure I got that right. North Central College in Illinois. Uh, and then he did his master's at, um, at John Carroll University, uh, working with Chris Scheele, well-known herpetologist Chris Scheele. Um, and uh, after finishing his master's, he did his PhD at the you know, through the joint doc program between San Diego State University and UC Riverside, working with Todd Reeder. Uh, and then following completion, and, uh, well, and for his PhD work, he worked on a number of things, including uh, squamate phylogenetics and divergence dating, but he also had a second project involving phylogeography of red diamond rattlesnakes, and he's actually been here and presented on that work uh, during a prior visit to DMDZ. Uh, he did a postdoc at University of Hawaii with Bob Thompson, uh, and then he did a second postdoc with Frank Burbring at the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, which has resulted in a bunch of publications involving snake phylogenetics and evolution uh, and various other topics as well. Um, uh, and then uh, more recently, he took a position at, uh, Wy at the Wyoming InBrave Data Science Corps. Um, and this is a position at University of Wyoming uh, where his role, if I understand it correctly, is essentially to provide guidance to other researchers on campus in genomics, mostly with genomics yeah. approaches, especially for people that either don't have the skill set yet to apply those techniques to their research or potentially don't have the computational or other resources to do it. So they have a program built into the system to assist their university in doing this kind of work, which is a pretty nice thing. Um, and I can tell you also that the position that Sean has allows him time not only, well, so he can, he's training people, but he's also collaborating with them. And then he also has some time on his, uh, for his own research program. So for those of you who are thinking of sort of non like research one professorial track jobs that still involve independent research, you might want to talk with Sean about you know, his experience at University of Wyoming or as part of this program at the lunch after the, uh, after the presentation here. So um, before I, before I turn Sean loose, I just want to mention that, um, you know, when I think of Sean's research program, I think of somebody who does like high powered, especially the squamate stuff, but the, but the snake work as well, um, like phylogenomic, phylogenetic, population genomic sorts of analyses. But he also is really interested in phylogenetic methods and sort of, you know, he's done some, some work on computational methods with Markov chain Monte Carlo. He's done work on trying to understand how to best perform divergence dating analyses and that sort of thing. So these would all be topics that you can discuss with them. 
if you stick around for for the uh, for the lunch after the the presentation. So Sean's talk today: population genomic responses of North American snakes to past and present climate variation. He gave a talk on Monday as well at Herb Group, so we're definitely getting our pound of flat. Uh, <laughs> so thanks, Sean, and uh, we're yours. Awesome. Thanks a lot for that introduction, Jim. It's great to be back at the MVZ. Always love hanging out here and just meeting everybody that's here. Um, so yeah, today I will talk about uh, population genomic responses of North American snakes to past and present climate, climatic variation. And if you saw my talk on Monday, there is a little overlap, but aiming for not too much here. Um, and can anybody hear, really hear too much about king snakes? So <laughs> worst case, you have to hear about it again. Um, so yeah, uh, I love snakes. So all of my research in recent years has really been, just been driven by I love snakes. I want to catch snakes. I want to learn about snakes. I just want to know things and be dealing with snakes all the time. This is a bunch of pictures of um, me from, oh, my master's and PhD, I think, or maybe these are all, oh yeah, that's my master's with a pile of uh, garter snakes that we found all in one day. Um, it's hard to, you can't even see all the heads. I think that was eight or 10. Um, but anyway, so I, I've loved snakes for a long time. Um, and uh yeah, I just think they're really cool. And on top of just being really cool animals, snakes are also really diverse. They're really cool from a lot of evolutionary perspectives. Um, I mean, one of the obvious ones being how they got so diverse with no legs on them, uh, which is awesome. Um, so of squamates, there's uh, more than 11,000 squamates. Um, I keep ripping this slide out of an old talk. So by now, I don't even know what that number is up to at this point. Um, and more than 3,800 of those are snakes. So this is the whole squamate tree and that big old like quarter, uh, more than a quarter of, of squamates um, are snakes. And so this is just a little tiny uh, snippet of some of the diversity of just things that I've caught in North America. Um, so all limbless, but lots of really cool diversity and variation across snakes. And you know, we don't necessarily think of North America as being a hotspot of um, global diversity for uh, many organisms, but um, it is for, well, for particularly things like plethodon salamanders, it is. And um, you know, even as not one of the hotspots for snakes, there's still lots of snake diversity in North America. Um, so this shows some of our species richness. And even just, you know, here and uh, particularly in kind of the Southwest and South um, and Eastern North America, we do have lots of species of snakes. Um, and just to show a few more pictures of snakes, because <laughs> why give a talk on snakes if you're not going to show some snakes in it? Uh, there's lots of models later on, so <laughs> don't worry about that. Um, but again, so, you know, these are all just North American snakes that I've caught over the last um, 10 years, 15 years or so. Um, you'll notice it's pretty heavily rattlesnake biased because I think they're really, really cool, but also a couple of king snakes in there. Um, almost entirely rattlesnakes and king snakes actually, because uh, those are my favorites. Um, and so this uh, really large snake diversity uh, across North America also uh, coincides with lots of environmental diversity. So uh, this is just a map of the uh, like level one eco regions um, defined across uh, North America, uh, which I don't have labeled here, but you know, includes things like hot deserts, uh, Great Plains, I think that's somewhere in Nebraska or Eastern Wyoming, um, and Eastern Music Forest. So lots of variation across uh, North America in terms of uh, climate and um, uh, kind of habitats that all these snakes are living in. And uh, those biomes are shaped um, you know, partially by the, the fauna that lives there, but also by uh, these, these kinds of uh, environmental uh, factors, so things like precipitation gradients. Um, if you're here on Monday, I think I showed this figure about seven or eight times, and I'll show it a couple more times today. Um, and so these gradients of these biomes, uh, so these are kind of our major biomes on the left across kind of all organisms as they're broadly defined. And then on the right, uh, we have this old map um, from uh, Jay Savage in 1960 of the Nearctic reptile and, amphib reptile and amphibian assemblages. We can see that that pretty closely parallels what we see um, here in our in our major Nearctic biomes. So you've got from this eastern, uh, this green here is eastern forest, and that 
pretty closely parallels what we see here with this um, even also labeled here, Eastern forest biome, look at that. Um, uh, and then also, yeah, kind of, uh, California biomes, our Great Plains biomes. So uh, really showing that we have this uh, major climatic variation across space and that this even just at broad levels across taxa sets up the boundaries for um, where there is turnover in species uh, within reptiles and amphibians. On top of having all of that variation across space uh, in North America, um, globally, but in particular, um, and especially in North America, we have lots of variation in um, environment and climate through time. Um, so most everybody here probably knows about um, like uh, glacial cycles during the Pleistocene and older uh, climatic shifts uh, that have occurred. And so North America was subject to all these glacial cycles and probably the most dramatic impacts of those are just ice sheets covering uh, Northern North America. And I always find this figure a little hard to look at because the color scheme is kind of backwards from the way that I sort of expect it where we're looking at Northern North America. So Canada's up here, Maine is kind of here-ish or so. And so these lines show the um, Southern extent of ice sheets. So at 21,000 years ago, Here's Lake Michigan and the ice sheets extended below Lake Michigan. And if we go look at our map of um, F the reptile and amphibian assemblages, Lake Michigan is over here. So we've got plenty of reptiles and amphibians, uh, including snakes that go well north of where ice sheets used to be. Um, so uh, you know, this is something that historically certainly had an impact on uh, many reptile and amphibian species, um, other species too, probably, but I don't know anything about those. Um, and uh, and snakes, and, uh, also snakes. So on top of just the like sheer physical um, effects of glaciers at their southern extent, there's also lots of impacts of uh, the overall changes in temperature through Pleistocene and other climatic cycles. Um, where it's not only that things were excluded from, from glaciated regions, but through the rest of North America, uh, suitable habitat really shifted around for uh, many, most probably, maybe all of the species that were living there, uh, living here. Um, so here we have um, just an example of uh, a niche model. I think this was actually for trees or plants of some sort, but it was a really kind of nice illustrative um, figure that I pulled out a little while ago that I keep using, um, where we see things where um, you know, species will have a current distribution or a current suitable climate that looks like what we see in this panel on the top left uh, during interglacials when temperature was warm during the Pleistocene. Suitable habitat might look pretty similar but when we are in those glacial cycles, so things like the last glacial maximum 21,000 years ago, the uh, ranges of the suitable habitat looks really, really different. So uh, you know, for whatever species this is that I've forgotten now, um, range was fragmented, um, or most likely fragmented into um, you know, these zones here in the West, some of these isolated regions um, over here, and any current, um, current habitat that's occupied in these gray zones is expected to be uh, population expansion since those uh, glacial maxima. Um, and this is a pattern that we really broadly expect across most species uh, living in these regions, uh, and especially things that are ectothermic that uh, you know require um, ambient temperatures to help them thermoregulate like snakes and other reptiles and amphibians. So, um, you know, we expect uh, all these species to have these types of responses. And one of the main questions that I'm interested in is are environmental responses shared across multiple species? And so um, using, uh, looking at this across multiple species of snakes is uh, one kind of potentially informative way to do this because 
we expect responses to differ across things that have really different physiologies, but snakes uh, for all their diversity and different ecologies do all share a lot of properties. They're all ectothermic, uh, they're all limbless, they're all predators. Um, so there is kind of an expectation that if, if anything is going to share similar environmental responses to something uh, as uh, kind of with as major an impact as uh, like glacial cycles, we might expect multiple species of snakes to show the same kinds of patterns. And so what I did was sequence a bunch of um, rad seq loci, so several thousand nuclear loci across the genome from each of these uh, nine uh, species or species complexes. And actually, I did not sequence the rainbow snakes, the mud snakes, or the uh, uh, milk snakes. Those were all um, existing projects by other folks in the lab and other collaborators. Um, Otherwise, we sequenced a bunch of uh, coach whips, rainbow snakes, um, corn snakes, uh, copperheads, milk snakes, brown snakes, king, uh, common king snakes, mud snakes, and uh, ringneck snakes. Um, yeah, yeah, using double digest, double digest rad seek. Um, I think it's pretty commonly known now. Um, and I forgot I jumped right in the slide. Jumping right into the results from that. Um, the first thing that I did was look to see um, across all these species in a kind of continuous spatial um, way, how do uh, geographic distance and environmental distances um, correlate with genetic distance? And so I'll show a, and I cut this off a little bit, which is unfortunate. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll walk through just how, how I did this on a single species and then show kind of a summary of everything. Um, but before I show just this kind of big summary figure, I want to explain a little bit of what goes into this. So uh, use this uh, generalized dissimilarity modeling approach that takes uh, geographic distance uh, as one of my inputs, as well as um, bioclim variables. So things like precipitation, temperature, um, which are unfortunately all cut off at the bottom. Uh, and then uh, environ data sets, so things like um, uh, an aridity index, I think is in there, um, and uh, topographic wetness, things like this. So various environmental distances as well as geographic distance. And then uh, to each of these uh, nine species or nine species complex complexes um, fit this model that uh, estimates the contribution of each of these distances to genetic distance over space. And, uh, well, space being the geographic, um, the rest of them are not spatial, spatially modeled. Um, and so this then estimates the importance and significance of each of those variables in affecting genetic distance. So this here is the variable importance for just one of these species complexes, the California, uh, the common king snake complex, which includes the California king snake. Um, and then you also get these curves over here that um, I talked about on Monday, but I won't talk about now unless anybody wants to talk about them later. Um, and so I ran these across all nine of these species or species complexes. Um, and this was the best way that I could think of to summarize this so far. Um, what this is showing is the variable importance of all of the uh, variables that I included across these nine species. Um, and so from this, I wanted to basically know, are the same environmental predictors affecting all of these snakes you know, in similar ways? And what we see is not really, like maybe a little bit. Um, Geographic distance is really important across most of them. Uh, for most of these species, it's the most important predictor of genetic distance, uh, which is maybe interesting or maybe kind of a trivial finding given that snakes are dispersal limited. So if you don't find ge uh, isolation by distance in snakes, you're probably not looking at a wide enough scale. Um, uh, so expected that, and it's always good to find what you expect at least in that sense. So um, that's mm -hmm. cool. Uh, but otherwise, everything is kind of all over the place. Um, you could almost trivially say that precipitation and temperature are broadly important, but that is also a pretty trivial statement <laughs> to make. Um, so yeah, uh, really finding that there is 
not a lot of um, no really striking patterns of similarity coming out across these. So we find different uh, environmental factors are important across many of these, um, unless you really squint hard enough and you want to start hand waving a lot. Or sometimes I do. Um, so after looking at that, to look at kind of present day and how uh, spatial variation in uh, geography and uh, climate affects um, genetic distance, I want us to look at um, population size through time. So like I was saying a few minutes ago, uh, we expect that with uh, climatic variation through time, especially things like glacial cycles and um, contraction of populations and species into refugia followed by expansion, uh, we know that many of these species have expanded because minimally some of these have ranges that extend above where the ice sheets were and snakes don't do well in glaciers. Uh, so we expect that most of these expanded recently. And uh, the question that I want to know is, are those post-glacial expansions synchronous? So do we have uh, concordance in the timing of those? So uh, to show this, we have these kind of pipe diagrams here. Uh, that I think Ariana Kuhn originally made and I've been using uh, since I started doing this, <clears throat> uh, where on the left is kind of our, our null model if we don't have co-expansion, where um, time is going uh, up towards the present, where different species of snakes, different species complexes uh, all expand, but they do so at different times you know, as a result of potentially different uh, environmental conditions or different uh, climatic events. Whereas on the right, uh, all of these populations expand at a single shared time point. And you know, we might expect this with glacial cycles because the glacial cycle happened or the retreat of glaciers happened at one time point. And so if snakes are kind of closely tracking that glacial retreat and that warming, they might all be expected to, um, to co-expand at the same time. Do a quick poll. Who thinks they all expand at the same exact time? Nobody. Uh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> We've got Jim and Jim alone saying they all expand at the same time. And well, so this isn't that test yet. This is this is our preliminary thing. So we'll see whether you're right or wrong in a second. <laughs> um, so um, the way that we tested this was um, using this program, um, PTA, which we'll talk about in the next slide. Uh, but as a first step before feeding all of these species into this uh, co-expansion estimation program uh, that Isaac Overcast uh, has written, we basically need to classify things as expanding or not expanding because if you put a bunch of taxa that are that are expanding into a program with a bunch of taxa that are contracting in population size, you're obviously not going to find co-expansion because something that's expanding can't expand at the same time as something that's contracting. Um, so to do that, we first ran this um, analysis stairway plot two on all of these. And you'll notice that there's quite a few more than nine um, lineages listed up here. And that's because to do this, we actually split those nine species, species complexes up into smaller populations. Mm -hmm. um, and we did that based on um, like SNMF results, uh, analogous to structure. Also, for some of these, we ran preliminary, uh, we, I ran um, preliminary stairway plot two analyses that um, we saw kind of these big uh, downward and upward spikes in, which is indicative of uh, population structure. And to do these kinds of population size analyses, you don't want uh, structure within the group that you're looking at. Um, because when you have population structure and you try to estimate population size from it, it biases your estimates. So we split things up um, to the point that we uh, think there's really only isolation by distance as the major um, kind of structure within them. Uh, so some of these splitting them quite a lot, like Diodophus punctatus. Uh, this is really only the eastern port. So for many of these also, uh, to point out, these aren't across the whole ranges of some of these. So this is only eastern diadophis. So trying to keep this all 
constrained to just Eastern North America where things might respond most similarly. Um, but even for that, we have a split diadophus into North Central and Southern lineages, um, ring neck snakes for those of you who are not herpetologists. Um, and so when we when we looked at this, um, you know, even just eyeballing it, you can see there's a lot of lineage, most lineages are expanding. There are some that are contracting. Um, I think that the mud snakes were contracting, Pantherophis amorii, um, the uh, rats, plains rat snake um, is contracting, but most of them are expanding. Um, and it looks a little bit like there's some degree of synchronicity there, um, but let's test how much. Um, so there's a few things going on all in this slide. Um, so what, before I talk about these results, I should have called these off in the slide, but I got excited about putting everything in one slide. So it's all here. Um, <laughs> is, uh, so we use this program, uh, Phylogeographic Temporal Analysis, um, that is written by Isaac Overcast, um, who is now partially a postdoc at um, the California Academy right now, uh, working with Reina. Um, and it uses a machine learning approach and the site frequency spectrum to estimate uh, these three major parameters from the data. One is this uh, zeta, which is the uh, num estimated number of co-expanding taxa. Uh, it also estimates uh, mm -hmm. timing of co-expansion and um, omega, which is the dispersion. So basically the kind of the variance around um, when taxa all co-expand. Uh, these figures on the left are all, um, uh, I believe, uh, like simulation validations of this showing that we can recover, uh, we can reasonably recover uh, parameter estimates based on some of the data, uh, particularly for uh, zeta, which is our number of core of co-expanding taxa and really the number that we care about the most. Um, trying to estimate time from this is tricky. So is trying to estimate the dispersion of it. Um, but that zeta is the, the number that we care about the most. And then this right panel here is um, our figure from uh, using a gradient boosting machine learning approach to estimate the number of, of co-expanding taxa. Um, if you want to know about exactly how this works, you'll have to talk to Isaac because um, I don't fully understand it. But um, so this is our um, histogram of the number estimated number of co-expanding taxa. So what we see is that we have the most support for either three or five co-expanding taxa. So definitely not all of these lineages are co-expanding at the same time. Some of them are. So Jim's a little right. The rest of you, the rest of you were probably slightly more right. Um, <laughs> Blow it up to fourteen. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Misleading question. I'll I'll give it to you. Um, cool. So uh, if we summarize this and ask, so across Eastern North America, do snakes show similar population genetic responses to present and past uh, climate? The answer is maybe a little bit. Um, distance is really important across them. Um, but again, that's kind of a trivial finding um, and expected. Um, otherwise, the effects of precipitation and um, temperature and these kinds of related variables are pretty variable across the different taxa. Um, and we, uh, both in space and time, really see lots of idiosyncrasy. So through time, some evidence for co-expansion of a few taxa at a time, but overall seeing lots of idiosyncratic responses across all of these different species. Um, and so that's really all that our analyses that we've done so far tell us is that they're not particularly shared. Um, so I get to be kind of hand wavy now um, about why that might be. And really what we expect is that there's probably lots of variation in these responses driven by the large amounts of variation in life history across all of these snakes. So one of you know, one, one of the major axes that lots of snakes vary on is just sheer body size. And we have huge variation in, in body size across these different snakes. So this is a, um, well, not an Eastern king snake, but a California king snake. 
and um, also not in Eastern Diadophus, in California Diadophus. Um, and, you know, this one is probably a four foot long king snake. That's maybe an eight inch long uh, Diadophus. These snakes have super different dispersal abilities. So as things are, um, you know, expanding geographically into uh, recently glaciated habitats, these king snakes are going to get into that habitat more quickly than the Diadophus are probably. Um, and they're also th things are eating really different uh, different prey. They're varying on all kinds of uh, ecological axes that will most certainly impact how they are affected by climatic fluctuations, both across space and through time. So this is where we start to overlap with what I was talking about on Monday um, with some uh, king snakes. So that's kind of the uh, comparative uh, phylogeography or comparative population genomics that I've been doing in recent years. And then um, to dig into how uh, climate is affecting individual species, used a single wide ranging species as a case study to do this. So um, I spent several minutes on Monday rambling about how much I love king snakes. I won't spend as much time here. <laughs> I think they're really, really cool. Um, so this is the Lampropeltis getula species complex. Uh, which is a uh, wide ranging uh, species or group of related species, depending on who you ask. I will not get into it today. Um, they ranges through uh, most of uh, southern, the southern US and northern Mexico. Uh, they're in these really different habitats. I've already talked about how we have all these different biomes across North America, and they occupy a large majority of them. And um, not just in similar microhabitats in these different habit different habitats, you can find them crawling across sandy desert floor or in eastern the eastern U.S. Uh, you know, near streams in shaded forest canopy. Uh, and historically, they were split up into uh, seven subspecies, then later uh, elevated to five uh, species based on mitochondrial DNA, which is what's shown here, uh, with all this really cool. Uh, pattern variation that you see across the species, which I think maybe isn't showing up super well on the screen, but uh, beautiful snakes with lots of variation across a really wide range, um, both geographically and in terms of the biomes that they occupy. And so uh, what I did with these snakes was uh, use a genomic perspective to look at um, how the populations are structured uh, as a start. And so I'll go through this fairly quickly. Um, this is an SNMF plot, which is similar to admixture or structure showing the population clustering. And what we see is that the best fit model, which is shown on the right there, is uh, three lineages or three population clusters rather than the five species or the five clades identified by mitochondrial DNA. We have this uh, blue California lineage, this red Splendida or desert lineage. And then uh, what has been several subspecies or three major mitochondrial clades all getting lumped into this big Eastern population. <clears throat> um, so I talked already about this generalized dissimilarity modeling. The example that I used of the single species was from the king snakes. So we've seen this figure already, um, but I'll talk about it a little bit more here. So with the king snakes, uh, as with the rest of the snakes, we really find uh, geographic distance as an important driver of genetic distance, as well as in this case, uh, we do see strong impacts of precipitation in the warmest quarter, so summer rains, and uh, Thorne's aridity index, um, a kind of composite metric of aridity, being important drivers of um, of genetic distance. And that's where I'll leave that for the sake of time. Um, and so if we think about these um, kind of precipitation and aridity, aridity gradients as being important drivers of genetic distance across this uh, species complex, if we go back and look at that map of the population structure and especially this split here between the eastern and the two western lineages uh, right at about West Texas, see that, that co coincides really closely with this major drop off in precipitation as we go from uh, Great Plains into desert. So a really uh, sharp drop off in precipitation uh, coinciding with this, suggesting this role potentially for, um, in the case of the king snakes, uh, precipitation and aridity in driving this um, 
continue uh, this discrete population structure across the species complex. I also went through and did some demographic modeling with this group to see what the history of divergence of these lineages was. And um, skip all through the details and just point out that this was the best fit model of 14 different models, including various parameters of um, uh, uh, various uh, migration parameters, various isolation, migration, uh, population size changes. And it's basically the most complex model that I fit. And um, so what this model is showing um, with the like 18 parameters or whatever that are in here is that we have the initial divergence among the ancestral lineages, a period of isolation, which is this gray bar. So when things were not sharing migrants, a period of migration, another period of isolation during which the uh, two Western lineages diverge from each other, a period uh, or a time point at which population size is increased. Um, so this divergence increase, and then uh, after which lineages all came back into contact and started exchanging genes again. So we can think of this as potentially being the result of uh, the end of uh, at the end of a glacial cycle where things diverge during the glacial cycle, as things start to re-expand when glaciers recede, or at, for things this far south, just when temperature becomes more hospitable, uh, populations start to expand, and then as they expand, they contact. Um, so this model of recurrent rounds of isolation and contact. And uh, I won't show the parameter estimates, but when you look at the estimates, the current migration rates are really, really asymmetric. So we see about an order of magnitude, I think, uh, higher migration going uh, at, across both boundaries from west to east, then from east to west. And I, think, oh, I don't have that next slide in there. Cool. Um, this is what happens when you chop, chop up a lot of talks into two different talks. Um, so one of my kind of hypotheses about this is that this is all related to arid adaptation. Um, this is all very, very hand wavy right now where it might be easier for um, lineages to move Eastern lineages, or sorry, easier from Western lineages that are air adapted to move into the East than for mesic adapted, wet adapted individuals to move West. Um, this could also be caused by a bunch of other population demographic effects. Um, so in the species, we see this mixture of continuous and discrete structure, multiple rounds of isolation and contact, uh, this potential role for climate in shaping that structure, uh, especially with these multiple rounds of isolation and contact, uh, which fits really well with this um, mixing isolation mixing model, which was I think, kind of formalized in this uh, 2019 paper, but I think people have been talking about for quite a while, um, where uh, lineages diverge through this series of um, of what it sounds like, mixing and isolation and then mixing. Um, so I think that this uh, this model being best fit is a really cool kind of support of this type of model where it's not the simple allopatry, not simple uh, isolation and secondary contact even, but um, these kind of recurring rounds of isolation and contact that are driving um, these patterns of both continuous and discrete structure in this really wide ranging species complex. And so uh, this is just about the end of what I'll talk about. And um, what I'm working on right now, uh, since it'll be really preliminary, is do some loci maintain divergence? So we have really high migration rates across uh, across those boundaries, especially from west to east. So Jim the other day said so the the west species are are different species, or the west lineages are oh, different sure. species from. Oh no, I love it! I love it. <laughs> uh, but um, anyways, uh, we don't need to rehash that. <laughs> Uh, so um, what I'm interested in is, are there certain loci that are resisting migration across those boundaries? So we have that really high rate of migration in some directions, at least. Um, are there individual loci that are, that are resisting that migration and helping to maintain the identity of those different lineages or those different population clusters? Um, and so what I've done is I've sequenced uh, 41 king snake genomes. And we're looking for individual loci or individual regions of the genome that show different patterns from the background uh, with elevated divergence. And I 
think for the sake of time, I'll kind of skip over how this all works for now. I'm happy to talk with this with folks at any point. Um, we calculate these different statistics and then we can use that to tell us about the process of what individual loci are doing and whether those are or maybe are not resisting migration. Um, oh, there we go. And so I have just started to do this. This is a figure that I generated, I think sometime last month and haven't had time to go any farther on. Um, so we can calculate all of these statistics across uh, here, just one chromosome of the genome. And if we go in and look at the zoomed in region of just our most divergent uh, based on FST. So I'll talk about these panels briefly. So this top panel, is FST an overall metric of population differentiation. These other two are um, DXY here is the uh, just raw sequence divergence expected between the uh, two lineages. Uh, so here I'm comparing just the East and West. And then within each population, the nucleotide diversity. And so what we see here is that we have this really high FST, but low actually low divergence between uh, the East and West king snakes, and then really low diversity within both of these. So this matches this kind of a scenario from uh, this figure from this Irwin paper a few years back, where um, basically we expect that this might be a result of a uh, past geographic sweep where this low divergence is because a an adaptive allele swept through all of the populations, um, because it's adaptive, not just in certain habitats, but for everything. And then after that, it starts to selectively diverge further. So advantageous to everybody, but then different alleles uh, of that, uh, or different variants of that allele become um, diverged and maintained at low diversity because they're adaptive to whatever uh, different habitats or whatever uh, different selective pressures those are. So I went through that quite quickly. Happy to talk about that um, later, but I want to make sure I leave some time for questions. So overall summary is that we do see some similar responses to environment, but lots of variation across uh, kind of this comparative look. This is probably mediated by uh, things like differences in dispersal abilities and all sorts of other ecological variants across these different species and different populations. And um, that this is probably a result of, or probably related to selection varying across lineages and through time. Cool. Uh, with that, I just wanna thank everybody who helped me out through this whole project. Um, my uh, postdoc advisor, Frank, who, uh, I was at the American Museum of Natural History with. I collected all this data while I was there and I'm still working through most of it. Um, and then everybody who gave me all the tissues for this, uh, all of this data was collected during COVID. So this is not stuff that I was able to do field work for. So quite a few of these tissues actually came from here. Uh, and then I will leave this up and take any questions folks have. For sure. Yeah. Uh, so it sounds like you've had at least three or five lineages that did show signs of co-expansion. Mm -hmm. Were those ones that had really far northern distributions? Because you can imagine if if there was previously glaciated, it would be the only ones that can get there are ones that are actually expanded. Right. Yeah. Um, so the question is um of the co-expanding uh populations, lineages, were those ones that are the most northern most northern distributed? And the answer to that is that we don't know because of the way that the co-expansion um, uh, method works, uh, which you'd have to ask Isaac about the <laughs> full details of, but my, um, it's because when you calculate all the summary statistics to do the machine learning on it, you can either sort them in which case you lose track of the identity of, of your, your bins, or you can leave them unsorted. And the method works better when you use the sort the sorted statistics. Um, Isaac might shout at me for how I described that, but I that is my basic understanding of that. So um, we don't know. We you know we can yeah we can eyeball that. Um, <laughs> we can do it on the fly, which I haven't done. Um, so there is what do we got? We got a central 
Diadophis, I think, and a Contortrix. So, at least based on this, some of some of these, I would say it seems like no. Um, it looks like it's maybe the, the two Copperhead lineages are, I think, this red one and this green one, which are look like some of the co-expanding ones, and those are fairly... Oh, yeah, the they're not the northernmost. Uh, the eastern ones are fairly far north, but um, wait, Isaac unclear. is on the chat. Oh, is he? Um, <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> Isaac, that's correct. You lose cool. the identifiability with the sorting, but it massively increases computational tractability. There we go. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Isaac. Yeah. <laughs> Can you do it unsorted though to see if you get similar results, and then maybe you'd have a chance of actually identifying which ranges are involved in the co-expansion? We can. Yeah. We might have to do that. We would know. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Uh, yeah, I was also going to ask about that, but also, you know, if, if you had any insight into, you mentioned a little bit about like life history traits that are important here, but also there's like egg laying versus live birth that might yeah. be really important here. And I would also imagine that uh, this is way more important for Eastern lineages than Western lineages in terms of like where, where that glacial expansion, just given the, I know your yeah. sampling is probably not the same as the lamp or pelvis sampling through here. It is not. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. You know, there's a lot of Southern lineages that aren't going to be affected much by the, the glaciation. Yeah, de definitely. Yeah, I, I think that there's, there's such wide variation across all sorts of axes for it but yeah I, I would expect that in particular southeast lineages are probably affected less um but yeah, even some of the western stuff um you know even though they're not in the glaciated regions um you know, like niche models that i've seen of some of that stuff really does still have them contracting quite a bit um like more than more than you might expect just kind of naively um so yeah i, I think it it's it's so it is it's so idiosyncratic i think really is the story that is consistently emerging from this is that even when we expect something like as dramatic as glaciation, things still all do their own thing. Yeah, sure. I should have a few questions. Sure. I'll have to ask them sequentially though. <laughs> so I have a question about, about whether or not the rad markers, mm -hmm. I mean, has it been documented that these things are evolving fast enough to tell you about mm -hmm. processes that could be as recent as 12 or 14,000 years ago. I mean, I think about something like, um, you know, Rory talks about the California and Andean condors and California condors have been through an extreme census bottleneck, but yeah. they still have a lot of genetic diversity, you know, that doesn't reflect that bottleneck yet. Like there's more uh, diversity yeah. in California condors apparently than in Andean condors. And so I'm, I'm just sort of curious whether people have done the simulations to show like what mutation rate or what process, yeah. you know, like rates would be necessary in order to be able to, to assess some of these things with those kinds of markers? That's a really good question. And I don't know to what degree that's been done. Um because yeah, that like there are there are certainly limits to that. Yeah, I mean, uh, is this a mutation driven process or could it be like you lose nucleotide diversity? So so yeah, so, I mean, it, so there could be other processes that don't require like a rate of mutation to be rapid enough. But right, yeah. So so you um because uh let me think for yeah so stereo plot 2 and um pta are both site frequency spectrum based so the site frequency spectrum will be affected not just by me it, it's not mutation is not required for for a signal of a bottleneck to show up um because if you have a bottleneck you should lose lots you, you should lose lots of your rare alleles right so so that just instantaneously, if you have a strong enough bottleneck, will affect the site frequency spectrum. But what will you see with the expansion? Because that's what you're oh, with the expansion. Yes, so yes, the yes, expansion yes. Is one thing, and right, 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 right. Yeah. So it. So so that. Yeah, you're right. Um. So that will depend on. Yeah, on the rate at which you can accumulate new uh, new mutations. So, if it's recent enough that you've accumulated, you know, effectively none, then yeah, you would not be you able to detect that. And if it happened. Even if yeah. I was right, and they all expanded. Yeah, <laughs> yes. So you, you could still be right, Jim. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's a very good question. That um, yeah, I, I don't know what the limits of that are. I think it's um, 
I mean, it would certainly be impacted by how many loci you can get, right? Because if you have, uh, if it, as the rate is slower, you need more loci to pick up the, the rarer mutations. Um, if, if it's so slow that you have effectively none, then even with the whole genome, you can't tell it. Um, so can you see like whether or not the, the um, this is the same question really. But, yeah. yeah. I think about crotophyta spicing torres. Crotophyta spicing torres has all of its genetic structure in the southern part of its range. And it's re yeah. this is a Western land. It's not in the east where the glaciers were, but they've clearly recolonized like a lot of the Great Basin, especially the northern part of the range, quite right. recently. And so, if you just look at something like a mitochondrial marker, like they're all identical mitochondrially at the at these higher latitudes and the lower latitudes, there's a lot more structure. Right, and right. I'm sure you'd see the same pattern if you were looking at SNPs uh, in the system. Just curious if that kind of information is like built into this, or if you know what it looks like for these lineages, or whether they show similar signatures. Yeah, that's. I don't know the timing of it. Yeah, I assume yeah. that it happened in the last glacial maximum. But sure. It a yeah. Lot earlier because mitochondria don't evolve that quickly. Right. 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 Yeah. yeah. That that's a good question that I I don't I don't know the exact answer to. And I I have to think more about that and how that shows up in how that shows up in the site frequency spectrum. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Though. Yeah. Um, I'm on the site frequency species. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that might. repeat that? Oh, sorry. Yes. Um. Yeah, I've been forgetting to do that. Uh, the only species that did not show um, uh, significant or important variables in the GDM was Steria. And why? Why is that? Um. Yep. Uh. I think this is a power issue. I had the fewest samples of steriria. Um, and I, yeah, I, I think it's a I think it's mostly a power issue. The the model overall was still significant, I believe. Um, but yeah, nothing, no individual variable showed up as significantly important, which I don't fully understand how that works. So that is something I need to figure out before I finish writing this all up. Um but yeah, I, I don't quite know. I have a similar question about that, if you don't mind me following yeah. up. I, I was wondering if you might see that pattern, because that also caught my eye that there was not a single one that shows any yeah. difference at all right. relative to others, and whether or not that meant that there's no genetic variation in your sample of steraria, so that they just don't show any mm, enough yeah. genetic, if there's no genetic variation, then you can't correlate it with anything. Right, right, right. Uh, or if it means that, um, that, there could be a lot of different variables that are all playing an equivalent role. And so you don't end up with one being identified as the best or, you know, not the power. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, any or some combination of that, I think could be going on. Um, I need to look at that one more. Um, yeah. Colin has raised his hand. Oh, oh okay. Hey. <laughs> Um, so, not, ma go ahead. Yeah. so maybe this is a uh, kind of a basic question because I'm not familiar exactly with how these sorts of demographic analyses work, um, but just with uh, what y'all were saying earlier about mutation rates, I was thinking that especially when you're looking at all these different groups of snakes in North America, like, you know, you got your diadophus and your rattlesnakes that maybe generation times might be different. Is is that the case? And is that something you take into account? That is also a really good point. Um for so for this uh for the stairway plot, because these are all individual, you can use different generation times for these. Um for PTA, you require it requires a single generation time. A lot of these probably have sort of similar generation times, but we honestly don't have great estimates of generation times across most snakes. Um, well, we maybe don't have great estimates of generation time across any snakes. We have um, pretty good estimates across maybe some, but not most. Um, so that is certainly a, a large potential source of variation in this that um, we unfortunately don't have a good way to account for. Um, without really having better estimates of those generation times. No. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Do you have another question? Another question, I was wondering about your method for parsing it into like three separate groups. 
Does that take some of the things that like structure does where it'll pick up the biggest groups first and kind of like you have to like isolate a particular group to then pick up the finer structures within? Oh, um, question was about splitting things into uh, splitting these groups out. Yeah, so um, the question was about uh, finding like the um, the biggest groupings for structure is prone to uh, finding the, the biggest population splits. And then you sometimes have to like look at just the Eastern lineage in another structure analysis and find the finer structure. Um, I so I this I spent, I, I spent a lot of time looking at this. Um, I don't, that, that's not the case here. Um, if you, well, it is and it isn't. Um, if you look at uh, K of five, if you look at five populations, then what happens is this Eastern lineage does split into um, uh, three with boundaries where the mitochondrial divergences are. Um, but if you go in and you look at um, like isolation by distance plots, what you see is that uh, this, this whole lineage is like one kind of linear cloud of points. So there is spatial structure there, but it seems to be far and away mostly continuous spatial structure of isolation by distance and maybe some small roles of like isolation by environment that might be causing just a few loci to move not quite as fast across those boundaries that might be shaping um, some of that, uh, like is, is, there is structure there, but it's it's very, very shallow. Um, and if you demographic model it and get like those uh, migration rate estimates, the migration rates between like between when you split this up, migration rates with uh, among those lineages are absurdly high, like, like 20 migrants per generation. Questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What sort of environmental variables do you think would separate New Mexico from Arizona? Basically, it's a really <clears throat> stark line there, right? Even more so than between different types of. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that um, Ed Myers has done a lot of good work on that, and he would like know that's this off the, the top. Yeah. Yeah. It's, mean, it's, it's, a, it's the kind of guy. Yeah. yeah. So. So it's it's the it's this um kind of like semi mountainous region where you have mountains, but also pass it. So it's yeah, the Cochise filter barrier because it's this filter barrier where it's not it's not like the Rockies where it's where it's you know one continuous mountain ridge. Um, there are a lot of low passes, but um, it's thought that that's enough of a barrier to movement. Um, Ed did um, Ed Myers uh, who was did his PhD with Frank. Um, looked at mm -hmm. some like 10 or so species of snake and th his, his stuff is published on this when I mean, he looked at a comparative study of a whole bunch of species of snakes across dense samples in this region to see how the Cochise filter barrier works in snakes um and he as we all increasingly find is that it's really idiosyncratic across the snake species a lot of them show just isolation by distance across here some of them show discrete structure there so exactly kind of what drives that kind of broadly is sort of unclear because yeah the, the it, it is a geographic barrier but it's not it's not a strong geographic barrier yeah it's a filter barrier. yeah <laughs> you know, that's the name um, um deserts me yeah yeah that's so that's where like the deserts have come together and then contracted mm -hmm. in different sort of the way to be recycled, like it's gotten more music and then they yeah. So I think yeah, like yeah. A lot of things show these there. Yeah, so a, a lot of this is is yeah. quite possibly also like secondary contact here, where yeah, where things were isolated and they come into contact here and they're somewhat divergent and maybe in the process of merging, maybe they're hybridizing and maintaining lineage identity. Um, unclear for broadly. So maybe historically there were different like. Um, I don't know, precipitation movements or something that would cause that, or really just like, you know, there's just mountains around there and then there's, you know, smaller passages for them to come through. Or those passages were, there were less passages historically, any of those sort of things. Yeah, I mean, the, the, um, the climate does differ in, in, in these different deserts too. Yeah, because is this, like, this is the Sonoran and this is the um, Chihuahuan and uh, I, used to know all this better than I do now. Um, but like like the um the timings of, of rainfall in, in those areas are different. Um I believe they're 
both monsoonally fed, I, yeah. but but the monsoons are I think at, at different times. Um, uh, and so, so yeah, the the, the precipitation regime, regimes are different. Um, you get you know, broadly different. Um, if the plant communities are are quite different in them. Um, communities in general are are different. Um, so okay. yeah, I don't, I don't know if I answered your question or not, but okay. <laughs> So I think at this stage, we should thank Sean, and then there's the opportunity for lunch afterwards.